Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Discussion Bound. Today is June the 9th. Uh, Discussion Bound is our monthly book group here at the Asheville Art Museum. My name is Christy McMillan. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the museum. And today we will be discussing um, the anthology Black Mountain Poems, edited by Jonathan Creasy. I am joined today by two moderators, Joseph Bethanti and Jay Bonner. Jay, by the way, is the one that we have to thank for that lovely music by John Cage that we were just listening to. Thank you, Jay. Joseph um, is the former Poet Laureate of North Carolina from 2012 to 2014 and recipient of the 2016 North Carolina Award in Literature. He is the author of 10 books of poetry, including Concertina, and winner of the 2014 Roanoke Chowan Prize. He is the author of four books of fiction, including The Life of the World to Come, and two books of nonfiction. He is the McFarland Family Distinguished Professor of Interdisciplinary Education and writer in residence of App State University's Watauga Residential College. He served as the 2016 Charles George VA Medical Center Writer in Residence here in Asheville and is the co-founder of the Medical Center's Creative Writing Program. Jay Bonner writes frequently for various publications such as the Asheville Poetry Review, Kirkus Reviews, and Argo. His writings have also appeared in Art Forum, Art Papers, the Greensboro Review, and the Quarterly. He is uh, also the author of an essay on Black Mountain College photographers forthcoming in the museum's uh, collection catalog. He has taught writing at various institutions, including Brown University, UNC Asheville, and Asheville School. We're also super happy to have with us as um, a special guest, Jonathan Creasy, who is the editor of the anthology that we read today. He is a writer, musician, filmmaker, broadcaster, publisher, and educator based in Dublin, Ireland, which he says today is a little dreary. <laughs> we have beautiful sunshine here in Asheville, so we will send that your way, Jonathan. He is editor-in-chief at New Dublin Press, a reporter for the History Show on RTA Radio 1, producer and presenter of The Writer's Room on 103.2 Dublin City FM, and an IRC fellow in University College Dublin, where he lectures in English and creative writing. His writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the Irish Times, Poetry Ireland Review, Gorse, The Stinging Fly, Los Angeles Review of Books, Asheville Poetry Review, the anthology Writing Home, The New Irish Poets, and many other publications. He edited and introduced the anthology Black Mountain Poems, which we're writing, uh, sorry, reading today, for New Directions. His film work includes the forthcoming documentary features An Inconvenient Masterpiece and The Blue Shroud Live in London. He is co-director of Dream Song Productions, an independent Irish film company. Just a few notes before we get started. Uh, you probably noticed when you logged in today that uh, your microphones and video were muted by default. Um, we will uh, come to a time here very shortly where I will allow everyone to unmute their microphones at will. And if you'd like to share your video uh, so that we can see who we're talking to, uh, you're welcome to do so at any time. Please choose a quiet room and close the door, silence any alerts from nearby devices. Since we do have the opportunity today to participate in the conversation, all of those dings and bings can be pretty dis distracting. If you do have on your video, try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or other strong light source. It just makes it hard for us to see you. Use headphones and a microphone for best sound quality. While you can log in using your smartphone, we do recommend using a desktop, laptop, or tablet to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. Make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial or first name and last name so that, again, we know who we're talking to in either the comments or out loud. To ask questions or make comments, you are more than welcome here in a second to unmute your microphone when uh, Jay, Joseph, Jonathan, or I ask for questions or comments. You can also type any of your questions or comments into the chat box. 
A third way to participate is to raise your hand in the participant sidebar. And when there seems to be a pause in the conversation, I'll call on you and unmute your microphone. We do recommend though, just jumping in whenever you have a question or a comment to participate in the conversation. We are recording today. So if you prefer not to be recorded, just make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to submit any questions and comments. Before we get started, I'd like to ask each of our special guests, how did you become interested in Black Mountain College and how does its history and legacy uh, fit into your work? So I'm going to allow people to unmute themselves and direct that question first to Joseph. Joseph, you just need to unmute yourself there. Gotcha, I hear you. Am I okay? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I was teaching at St. Andrew's Presbyterian College in Laurenburg in 1985, and I'd been in North Carolina for a while. I knew some of the Black Mountain poets, but I was completely ignorant of, of Black Mountain College, and I'm kind of ashamed of that, to tell you the truth. Um, and, and a professor there, Ronald H. Bays, who was friends with with Olson and Creeley and, and just all of those folks put in my hands Duberman's book. Um, I read it in a, a matter of days and was kind of an evangelized that this, that this had, had occurred and that I had known nothing about it. I thought I, I was ostensibly educated, et cetera. Um, and so I, I launched pathologically into kind of in, into Black Mountain College, and it, I've allowed it to trail my teaching around. And in 2018, I um, instituted something at Appalachian State University called the Black Mountain College semester, and we had an entire semester devoted to Black Mountain College. And I've just kind of read pathologically about it, and then we lived in Old Fort for a while from. 1988 to 1990. So I was right in the shadow of Black Mountain College. So I visited those campuses. And I mean, you all know how that happens with Black Mountain. Something, <laughs> something grabs you and it's all over. Absolutely. And of course, we've seen you uh, plenty over the years bringing your students during the Black Mountain College semester here to the museum to, to research using our materials. I should mention, since uh, Hilary Schroeder, our assistant curator, is also here on the Zoom, that about a quarter of the museum's collection is dedicated to uh, Black Mountain College artists um, who either uh, taught or took classes at the, uh, at the college, um, as well as a significant amount of archival material. So it's definitely um, an important resource for our collection. Um, Jay, same question. How did you become interested in Black Mountain College and how does its history and legacy fit into the work that you do? <laughs> Jay, sorry, uh, I'm going to mute you. You're, <laughs> you're coming through as Mickey Mouse here. Uh, let me try that again. <laughs> Okay, hold on. Oh, technology. There you go. Try again. <laughs> Sorry, no, you're still, <laughs> you're very high pitched. Can I just suggest maybe uh, unplugging and plugging back in your microphone or logging out and logging back in? Maybe uh, I'll ask this question of Jonathan. Maybe you can log back out and log back in. Okay, see you in a second. So Jonathan, uh, same question to you. How did you become interested in BMC and how does its history and legacy fit into your work? You're muted. So There you go. You can hear me. Yep. Well, first of all, thank you so much to Jay and Joseph and, and Christy. It's great to be having this conversation um, around the book. Um, a lot of the things that Joseph said uh, echo with my experience as well. Um, I I suppose it, it started um, long before I even knew about Black Mountain College. I studied at CalArts, um, an experimental institution in its own way. Um, I studied music there, but it's a very interdisciplinary school where the overlap and interaction of all of these arts and disciplines was quite important. Um, I then moved to Ireland 15 years ago, where I've lived and worked ever since, and did my PhD work and teaching in Trinity College Dublin, which is a very different institution, 500 years old, um, quite set in its ways, not as experimental, certainly, 
there I gravitated towards uh, American poets, particularly Olson and Creeley. Um, and that's where, that's certainly where it started. And when I was interested in Olson and Creeley, when I was first reading them, I didn't know anything about Black Mountain. Um, and Black Mountain really just appeared as an address on, on Olson's letters that he was sending to Creeley during that, that early 1950s period. And as Joseph said, once I found a way in, I just kept going deeper and deeper. Um, I did my PhD thesis on poetry and pedagogy at Black Mountain, trying to locate what was specific about Black Mountain poets in terms of what was actually happening at the college itself. Um, that then started to you know, form and reform the things I was doing as a musician and filmmaker and artist in my own right. I did a lot of the archive research in the state archives in North Carolina and the Olson archives and Creeley and all of this. Um, and it really did just continue on from there. Uh, this opportunity to edit the anthology came around 2016, I suppose. Barbara Epler at New Directions uh, approached me about doing it with a fairly specific idea of doing a, a small anthology, um, very much like the one that you see, although it did take quite a while for it to come together and for it to come out. Um, but it continues to influence the way that I teach and the way that I think and the things that I make. And I think it gives kind of a context for um, combining all of those practices in, in what we all do. And I think most importantly, in a way, it was the community around Black Mountain, around studying Black Mountain and around using the legacy to explore contemporary art and thinking and teaching um, that continues to sort of invigorate me when I when I go back to it, which I constantly do. So. Well, thank you. It's really uh, a pleasure to have you, uh, you on with us today. We've all enjoyed reading <laughs> reading the book. Um, Jay, you want to try again? How, does, how do I? Yes, that's okay. that's the deep Good. Jay voice Good. that I know. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. And Jonathan, we're really excited to have you. And I want to thank Mary Emma Harris, who, who made this happen um, and, and, and wish we had thought about it even sooner uh, to have you moderating this whole thing. Yeah, and I want, to, I want to chime in and say the very same thing. It's a real thrill. Um, it's a perfect storm. And thanks to Mary Emma. Yeah. yeah. But my, my introduction to Black Mountain College came through a high school teacher, Mike Clark. He and his wife left upstate New York to move to Asheville because of the college back in the 70s. And, and I had a chance to study with him in high school. He introduced me to the work of M.C. Richards, the writing and the pottery. Uh, so the craft side of her art, as well as the, the writing side of it. And also introduced me to Robert Creeley's poetry um, but, 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 but really sort of a, a general introduction with, with some deep dives into some specific people. But I remember buying Centering uh, back when I was in high school and, and really being interested in, in what she was trying to, to achieve in those essays um, about education and, and, and community. The, the next sort of phase of my introduction, I had a teacher at, at, in college Wallace Valley, who was a good friend of Ron Bay's, sure. as well, uh, J Joseph. And um, so through Ron's work and, and, and Wallace's influence, I had a little bit more exposure to some of the Black Mountain College poets. I remember buying Olson's uh, Jargon, uh, Maximus Poems uh, paperback uh, back at that time and trying to, to understand what he was doing with those poems. And then Later, um, I was in grad school and Chan Gordon, um, Chan and Megan uh, ran Captain's Bookshelf here in Asheville for years and years and years. I unfortunately, will not make their 50th downtown at least, but uh, Chan introduced me. I had lunch when I came back from grad school one, one holiday with Jonathan Williams and Tom Meyer. And, and that lunch, uh, I loved, it's really funny because I look back on it and chuckle. I really loved talking to Tom. The, the new Proust, Kilmartin translation, three volume had just come out. We were talking about Proust and that translation. I thought Jonathan was a bit of a curmudgeon, uh, kind of an old grumpy guy. But, but um, Jonathan ended up, that, that kind of a facade of his, but I ended up really uh, getting to know the two of them well, but Jonathan really enjoyed getting to, to meet him, spent some time down in Islands. 
And because of that connection, started buying a lot more of the jargon uh, publications. So, for example, my introduction to Lou Harrison was as a writer, not as a composer, um, uh, because because of the uh, jargon press series. And um, then after that, more recently, continued to stay interested in the college, predominantly because of the interdisciplinary nature and qualities of it. And in the sense that, as Jonathan quotes uh, Rice in, in that introduction, that there was a kind of an art spine through the whole thing, but it's not an art college, or at least it wasn't in the 30s and 40s, um, probably became much more so by, by the end of its, its time. But then had a chance to take a class. I'd actually been exposed to Mary Emma's work because of Jonathan Williams, knew that she was interviewing folks and putting together her book before it actually came out, had a chance to take Mary Emma's class at UNCA, and, and that sort of reignited my, my real appreciation for the college and, and for the writers and artists and, and the, the, the many people who went through that. We had a summer institute for teachers here at Asheville School, summer of 2018. Mary Emma was our keynote speaker and participant, and, and that just deepened my appreciation for what, what this college represents. I should say too that Mary Emma has been a very good friend and really important to me uh, in, in the work that I've done, so helpful and you know we wouldn't know much of what we know about Black Mountain College without her. So I did, I did want to say that as well. Thank you. Um, so I should mention too that Jay at Asheville School, I think that uh, the interdisciplinarity of the approach to education there um, is probably in no small part inspired by Black Mountain College. So um, I, did, uh, I didn't want to assume that folks had a deep knowledge of Black Mountain College before we launched into the discussion of the poetry. And so I asked Joseph if he would just give a real uh, quick overview of BMC, um, especially in this um, different lens. Usually here at the museum, we think about BMC through the lens of the visual arts um, and not necessarily through literature. So Joseph, can you just give us a brief uh, introduction to BMC and the role of writing there? Yeah, and, and I'll kind of rip through this um, and maybe there will be time for Q&A. I know we just have an hour, so I don't want to, I, I, I want to make sure there's plenty of time for folks um, listening in to chime in and that we can actually dig into the book. And, and I would also um, direct you back to Jonathan's introduction because a lot of what I'm going to thumbnail, he details in, in a little more depth than I'm going to go into. But, you know, Black Mountain College, um, you know, Duberman, I love, always love to use this quote from Duberman. He said it was the forerunner an exemplar of much that is currently uh, considered innovative in the arts, in education, in lifestyle. And I think that's still the case too. I mean, it's really um, growing more and more. We see more graduate theses, we see more folks. Um, if, if, if you saw how many international folks show up at um, the archive up on Rice Road in, in Asheville, it's kind of astonishing. So um, it, it, it existed. <clears throat> from 1933 to 1957. Um, it was founded by, by John Andrew Rice, who left Holland's, um, Rollins College in Winter Park, New York, Winter Park, Florida. He was a, talking about uh, curmudgeons, he was a firebrand, iconoclast, etc. It's worth mentioning that his papers are all at Appalachian State University, where I teach, too. So, in a kind of huff, he left Rollins in 1933. Um, that first semester, he had, Ted Dreyer was with him, and I think often people consider Ted Dreyer a co-founder of the college as well. Um, in, in, he, he's never really gotten the credit, I think, that he deserves as well. So that first semester, fall of 1933, um, at the Blue Ridge Assembly, the first campus, there were 13 faculty and 26 students. Uh, Malcolm Forbes, who was also a uh, Rollins professor, provided the majority of the underwriting for startup. In, in its history, there were roughly 20, 1,200 students, um, approximately 60 graduated. There were no grades, uh, process, claimed dominion over product, 
faculty were paid on the basis of need. Um, when there was enough money, they re received small salaries, room and board, much of the food um, that they ate and subsisted on was grown on the college form, uh, farm. Um, during its inception, it became a sanctuary for Jew Jewish intellectuals um, fleeing the scourge of Nazi Europe. Um, that's how Albers comes in and his, his am amazing wife, Ani, who was a legendary weaver and a Jew and had to get the heck out of Europe. Um, in 1941, the college moved just a few miles away to its campus at Lake Eden, Camp Rockmont. Um, I, I think that's that's the campus most people know people know about. Uh, students and faculty built the studies building with minimal professional assistance. Its original designer was Walter Gropius from the Bauhaus, but his design was a little too expensive, a little too lavish and ultimately a design by A. Lawrence Coker was, was used. Um, Jonathan mentions in 1944, Elma Stone Williams showing up on the campus. I mean, that's a huge chapter and something I'm profoundly interested in. Again, that was 10 years before Brown versus um, Board of Education. It was before Authory and Lucy integrated the University of Alabama in 1956. And arguably, Elma Stone Williams is the first African American student um, to attend an all white college in the Jim Crow South. She was there for 11 weeks. Um, this, the summer session of 1944. That's the same session too. I'm certain that Jean Charlot was there creating the murals in the frescoes on the bulwarks underneath the studies building. Um, you know, um, just just some some quick highlights. In 1948, Buckminster Fuller constructed his first geodesic dome there, which was christened the, the Supine Dome by Elaine de Kooning. He then returned and, and actually erected one that stayed up. Um, you know, the much vaunted first happening occurred there in 1952. These are all, again, entire chapters of Black Mountain College, but these are kind of thumbnails that people tend to know about. In 1953, in, in, in Lake Eden, Merce, Merce Cunningham founded the Merce Cunningham Dance Company. Um, during the 50s, uh, under, under Olson's leadership, and that leads us to, to what we'll be talking about, the literary arts, notably poetry, took center stage, and from this emerged the so-called School Black Mountain Poets. Um, they, they, they were dubbed that, and Jonathan touches this, in the New American Poetry, edited by Donald Allen in 1960. Six of those poets actually had their feet on the soil at Black Mountain College, while four, it's kind of arbitrary how they ended up there. Um, four of them never set foot there. They're all, again, detailed in Jonathan's um, introduction, although Paul Carroll was one of them, not included in, in this anthology. And they were kind of chosen either because they were at Black Mountain College or they published in Black Mountain Review or Sid Corman's also cutting edge magazine, um, Origin. Um, Olson's famous essay, Projective Verse, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, was also in that anthology. Um, although I, I love that Jonathan has in his introduction that Olson poo pooed that whole notion of a Black Mountain College, a Black Mountain School of Poetry, as he says, um, it was all Charlie Parker, it was all Charlie Parker. And in, in a lot of those poets, Creeley notably listened to jazz as they composed for the improv, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, the Black Mountain College Poetry School then leaked into and influenced the beat movement. The beats were concurrent, certainly with Black Mountain, but also influenced the San Francisco Poetry Renaissance and um, the New York School at all. Um, 
just really quickly, the Black Mountain College Library was sold off by Charles Olson. It now resides at North Carolina Wesleyan University. Um, and as I mentioned, ASU has John Andrew Rice's paper. Um, the litany of famous people is prodigious and profound. I won't go through all of them, but but I'm I'm often reminded that of, of what what um, Fielding Dawson, who who was a, a a very good friend of mine for ten years before his death, said. He said, "Forget the big names, because often we forget that um, you know, along with the famous artists like." Cage and Cunningham and Olson and Rauschenberg and Motherwell and Bucky Fuller and you name it, the list goes on. There were a lot of other really extraordinary artists still practicing their art today. There's this crazy longevity among Black Mountain College alums um, who never got that kind of marquee attention, but nevertheless have influenced the culture in the 20th century. And I think it's also important to, to realize that Black Mountain College produced innovators in education, science, psychology, so, social work, urban planning, architecture, politics, you name it. Um, we see it as an art school, but, but John Andrew Rice said that he was especially not interested in founding an art school, yet arts really did take center stage of Black Mountain College. Um, Jonathan mentions a number of books that are very important for if you want to, you know, bone up on Black Mountain. Certainly, Duberman's uh, Black Mountain and Exploration and Community, um, Mary Emma's book, um, it, you know, is 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 seminal. Um, the Arts at Black Mountain College, um, Vincent Katz's book is mentioned too. Molesworth's giant four hundred pound volume, and, and, but but I would also encourage you to take a look at Fielding Dawson's um, The Black Mountain book that came out in 1970, two years before Duberman's, um, and, th and then was reissued by North Carolina Wesleyan Press in 1992, a kind of revised uh, edition. That, that, that's in the vernacular, it's a kind of eyewitness student look, so it's a really, really interesting book and, and worth looking at. Um, Catherine Zomer's film, um, Fully Awake, is, is kind of the film. I'm sure more and more films are going to be cropping up, and I'm kind of surprised that, that they haven't. Um, so while, while I'm just here, and then I'll hush, um, you know, there were also the Black, Mount, the, the Black Mountain Review, which again, Jonathan mentions, um, you know, in... <sighs> There were seven volumes. They're as rare as hen's teeth now, um, and they're expensive as heck. Um, we actually have seven pristine copies at, at, at Appalachian State University. Um, and that came out of this just miraculous collaboration uh, between Olson and Creeley long before they even met. Um, so six of the Black Mountain volumes, there are seven of them, were published in Mallorca by Creeley in Divers Press. The seventh, the so-called uh, beat issue that contains, um, contains pieces by Kerouac and Ginsburg and Burroughs, and a lot of those folks was actually printed um, here in the United States. I think Jonathan Williams might have printed that. Um, and in, so again, they're really expensive, they're rare as, as hen's teeth and, and really important contribution. And it's really important to say, again, if I have time, I'll talk about projective verse. I, I don't want to, I don't want to take too much time because I have a sense of the clock, um, turning, but the Black Mountain School or the Black Mountain Poets were a reaction against what they saw as a really stultifying conservative grip that the establishment poets had on poetry at that time. Um, so it's very iconoclastic. You'll notice that it's, it's, it's experimental. It's, it's, it's difficult, but there are wonderful ways into it and it illuminates an entire world that we wouldn't have had had we not 
had those poets. So let me hush for now and, and, and get somebody else to talk. Thanks, Joseph. Um, I'm so glad to have uh, you, Joseph, and Jay, and Jonathan um, here today because I, I'd like to jump into the poetry uh, that we read, um, and especially because I completely self-professed have a really hard time with poetry. I know I'm not the only one in the world. Um, so I'm glad to have you all here um, to guide that conversation. Maybe look at some poetry. I know, Jay, you had um, something that you wanted to, to have us look at uh, to think about sort of the wording and the punctuation and um, how things are read out loud. I was really struck um, by Jonathan's comment in the introduction uh, about jazz and musicality and the role that it plays um, in, in reading these poems um, and how perhaps, Joseph, um, what you had said in one of our earlier conversations, that perhaps the best way to enjoy this poetry is not necessarily reading it silently, but reading it out loud. So, um, yeah, I, I would just jump in really quickly, two seconds. Um, Ron Bays, again, who who I almost I, I I I call him a Black Mountain College poet because he was a contemporary, and his work act, actually mirrors this. I was reading Creeley, and I was saying, hmm, hmm, hmm. He said, "You won't get Creeley until you hear Creeley," and by God, that was right, you know. So, <laughs> um, so I think that that is the case with poetry writ large, but often with the Black Mountain poets. You have to hear them. It's all about music. It's about the breath. Um, you, you hear it, so. I would say too that, and, and it, it's in keeping with Black Mountain as an institution and an experiment itself, but not just in the poetry, but in all of the art forms practice at Black Mountain and all of the ways of thinking appeals to forms outside of the form that's being practiced in poetry, looking to music, looking to visual art, and the relationships between all of these. A lot of these poets in this case looked to um, other artists around them and other art forms around them to break through what, you know, Joseph was saying was uh, 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 what they saw certainly as, as the, the more conventional and more establishment poetry of the time. So that interaction is quite important and that's one element that I tried to get into the selection in, in the poems as well. Well, speaking of the selection, Jay and Joseph and I were wondering how did you tackle that like monumental task of selecting um, poets and poems for the volume? Yeah, well, I'd say first there's, you know, there's a number of interests involved in, in creating an anthology, any book really. I mean, it, it, it ultimately, you know, many hands are involved. I did select all of the poems. But in terms of actually making and, and marketing a book, there are all kinds of concerns. So, you know, it's not simply uh, my, uh, you know, sort of politics or poetry that, that uh, make, make the selection what it is. Um, I suppose it began, I mean, New Directions actually had the idea for a Black Mountain Poems anthology because, of course, they noticed that New Directions publishes uh, a number of these poets, including Olson and Creeley and Denise Levertov. Now, of course, I was bringing to the selection and to the process my own thoughts and feelings and study and research on Black Mountain, which was admittedly a bit more interested in, in the idea of the poets who were there and who were, again, participating in this experiment in education and art and what that meant. Um, but just for example, you know, Denise Levertov was going to be in there because it was a New Directions anthology and uh, she's, she's a wonderful poet. So there were a number of things that went into the selection in terms of the actual poets uh, who were involved. Of course, as I mentioned, we did decide the, the idea the whole time was to have a, a slim book. There, this was not an attempt to be comprehensive. Um, it would have taken uh, quite, quite a bit longer, I suppose, if, if that were going to be the case. Then there was, of course, the, you know, the, the, the issue of permissions and estates and things like this. Of course, New Directions was amazing with this and, and really you know, did all of that work for me. And I don't really think there was much that we wanted to get a hold of that we couldn't, but this is quite a difficult process. So again, that's just to say, while I did select all of the poems, there are all of these other concerns. In terms of actually creating, and, and this connects to what, what we were discussing before, in terms of choosing the poems and then ordering them. Um, 
I paid a whole lot of attention to the interactions again um, and the sound of the poems and the way they were read in order and in the order that I was writing them. I knew that, for example, Robert Creeley, as you mentioned, when he came to what he thought was a final version of a poem, he would just read it constantly over and over again. And this is essentially what I applied to the, the selection in the anthology as well, uh, thinking that this would get at what you know, Joseph was identifying as something um, typical and, and fundamental about Black Mountain poetics, that it does exist uh, uh, off the page, outside the page, on the breath, uh, and, and as sound as much as uh, text. So all of those things, you know, went, went into it. And then, of course, just my, my personal preference, which you can criticize me for, but I, I won't apologize for it. <laughs> so all of those things, uh, all of those things were involved. Yeah. Jonathan, were just, just, were, were there some poets that you were trying to get in there that, that just didn't make the cut? And in, 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 in as you're puzzling, Thank you for getting Mary Caroline Richards and Hilda Morley, for goodness sakes. Mm. Um, when I first read um, New American Poetry way, way back, I was thunderstruck at M.C. Richards. I didn't even know about Morley then, but I was absolutely thunderstruck that she was mm. ignored. It seemed intentionally, um, I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, and especially for those, unethical almost yeah right and especially for those you know who who have been lesser known and, and sort of neglected over time it's more difficult to find their work to find uh, even copies of books that they published let alone estates that can you know uh give permissions to to republish the work etc um and and yes it, there was a, a a big concern of of making sure that those poets and those voices that hadn't been represented in other anthologies. Well, of course, there's plenty of people that you could point to who perhaps should be in the book that, that aren't. I also wanted to include, you know, the likes of Joseph Albers uh, in, in the beginning there. Uh, I'm quite interested in the connection to the Bauhaus and the way that this moves into the, the Black Mountain arts and, and education. There was also, I mean, I, I'm not thinking specifically of poets who I wanted to include that I didn't, but there was a lot of discussion and thought given to just what a poem is and what, what you know, what so many people at Black Mountain were doing all kinds of things. I mean, Mary Caroline Richards came there as a literary scholar and a poet, ended up being a potter. You know, people were practicing in all of these different disciplines. And who's to say that you know, a Ruth Asawa sculpture isn't a poem in a certain sense. And, uh, you know, obviously we had to go with, you know, text that resembled uh, uh, poems as most people understand them. But I did want to give readers, uh, even casual readers of the anthology, a sense of all of the influences and all of the practices that were going on. So even including quotations or photographs of some of these other artists who we didn't identify by poems necessarily written by them, but just by referencing their presence there and their presence in the, um, the vein of Black Mountain you know, experimentation and art, I thought I could give a, 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 a sense of what I think was going on there. And as I believe I say in the introduction, um, you know, send people off to do the explorations for themselves as well, because this is what we discussed, becomes so obsessing and obsessive about Black Mountain is that you constantly find new things and new areas of interest um, and so that's all I could hope for was to send people off on, on their own uh, journey on, on this. So hopefully it's representative, but it's certainly not comprehensive in that sense. We have a couple questions for you in the chat box, Jonathan. Um, oh. Did you determine how the poems were visually presented or did the poets themselves set out how their poems should be visually presented? Would have been, it would have been very bold of me to decide how uh, Charles Olson's poems looked myself. But um, no, the, the poems are presented in, in the way or certainly as close to the way as they were intended to um, from the beginning uh, by the poets themselves. And you can see how visually different these, these poets uh, were, um, Olson in particular. Now, that's an interesting idea of, you know, or, or fact of the limitation of any anthology and, and especially one that's succinct in this way is that my feeling is that Olson's work is, you know, he's it's the Maximus poems. It's about uh, the, the size and the scope of it. So of course you're limiting that element in, in a certain sense, even just by the page space Olson 
left a lot more space uh, in, in terms of blank space on the page and this sort of thing. But the poems are uh, presented as, as the poets uh, wrote them, at least as close as, as can be. The cage poems come to mind with the mesostics, the, the, the word, the, the lines that are arranged around a, a central word that moves down the center of the page. Um, and I'm very grateful to, um, you know, the, the, the people who did the layout in that sense, because I didn't achieve that myself. Judy, I think that um, what uh, Jonathan just talked about related to your question, but do you want to expand on what you had uh, asked in the chat box? Oh, sorry, I didn't read it properly. No, 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 it's, no, no, it's fine. It was a separate question, mm. but related. Go ahead, Judy. You're muted. There you go. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Hi. <laughs> So I, so I know that, um, so I, I just wondered, does open field uh, poetics relate to open space the way, I think Cage and Varez and maybe Volpe um, were talking about it in terms of music, which also had a relation to uh, freely moving forms and Calder picked up on that. And I think, I think that Varez and Calder had some uh, communications about that sort of thing. I just wondered if all of that open, you know, whatever, it, it, it's all related, um, explicitly related. I, I mean, I, th I, I think so. Um, and this, this kind of metaphor, whatever it is, of the opening of the field and this idea was, was um, certainly common among these artists and, and others. The open field poetics, um, it is this sense of breaking up the, the, the staid verse, the verse that print bread, as Olson says in the projective verse essay. While, of course, the contradiction in that is that Olson's poems are extremely visual and, and you know, they, they exist as visual works on the page as well. So I see the open fields just as much as a projective um, sort of sound or breath metered verse uh, just as much as it might be akin to you know a, a canvas space uh, and words moving like shapes on on a, a visual piece of work so yeah I think these you know these metaphors or ways of um, approaching the art was common and they were feeding off one another and that there's analogy to um, certainly the music um, and I mean in Creeley's case it was jazz music with the, you know, with the particularly forward-thinking um, kind of contemporary classical music of the time, I don't think that many of the poets would have been particularly well versed in that, and certainly not, you know, coming from Volpe or, or something like this, but they were certainly aware of it, and they were being exposed to that kind of music um, at Black Mountain. It was mostly the jazz music that seems to come through the actual poetics it itself. Um, and there's a whole lot more to say about that, I suppose. I don't know if that's what you were asking. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and I, and I wondered, uh, I mean, I, I thought what you said was really important that um, it wasn't just poetry and art and, you know, that there was always this merging. Of... Well, and Olsen took one of the great uh, uh, stories or anecdotes that I've heard, at least, is that Olsen participated in one of Merce Cunningham's dance classes, you know, this sort of thing. And the idea there's, you know, that that moving from one thing to the next and allowing that to open up the central kind of artistic practice is what the place was about. And that's what I'm quite, quite interested in in that way and what it can achieve and what that kind of community and interaction can achieve in that way. And I think that's explicitly what virtually every person at Black Mountain um, attests to is that the power of that particular aspect. Yeah. And you see it even, what's interesting also is to, is to see how that influence continues to spiral into the present. Uh, exactly. The Black Mountain Songs uh, piece that, that uh, was performed just in the last couple of years, both up in New York and then down here at, in Asheville. But you have a number of people, sort of contemporary rock bands, the National, Arcade Fire, who are going back to the Black Mountain College poets uh, in a way. And, and taking that work and music into the into the rock music vernacular and song structures, you have P.J. Arvery, uh, who I think is very much uh, quoting Creeley in a song. Uh, you, he said something. Uh, you said something, and and I think that's you know Creeley. I don't know how many 
you said something poems he's written, but 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 there are dozens, and mm -hmm. and it's just interesting how those strands continue in in pop culture today. I would argue. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say too. Long before we bandied about the words interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary, mm -hmm. Black Mountain organically was that. Yes. Um, with with without before we had language for it. Again, it 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 was that. It manifested that organically and improvisationally too. Um, and this is what, you know, in the archival record and going into those archives, it's, it's what was so fascinating to me that it didn't feel like studying a dead thing that was finished, you know, it seemed like something, and that's due to the efforts of, you know, the museum and, and all of these institutions and individuals in and around Asheville and, and honestly around the world who are drawing on this and creating new work based off of it, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if uh, any of the three moderators or any of the participants uh, in today's uh, Zoom would be willing to identify and share uh, maybe their favorite poem from the anthology. Maybe we can read it aloud and try and understand it together. Chris, I'd love to hear this is my weak point, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the one of the folks who have joined us. That would be great to hear from y'all. Just a yes. poem that hit you in the head, or or you heard, or you came back to. Well, John, Cage, John Cage's poem is pretty cool, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's really visual too. Judy, can you tell us the page? Yeah, I have to look for it. Sorry. Um. 59. 59, okay. And then I, I saw you, Sandy, raise your hand, so we'll, we'll get to you uh, Great. next. Uh, which one in particular, Judy? So the composition. The composition and retrospect. Composition. Judy, oh, you, yes. Uh, you want to read that for us so we can actually hear it? Oh, God. Oh, you yes, got this, please. Judy. Go for uh, it. All right. <laughs> Everybody's cheering you on. Okay, I want, I want to point out first that the word indeterminacy is um, spelled out with the capital letters yes. over and over in mm -hmm. the poem, yes. which, which determines the structure, I suppose. So, yes. You can't be serious, she said. We were drinking, a record was being played, not in the place where we were, but in another room. I had found it interesting and had asked what music it was not to supply a particular photograph, but to think of materials that would make it possible for someone else to make his own a camera. It was necessary for David Tudor something a puzzle that he would solve, taking as a beginning what was impossible to measure, and then returning what he could to mystery. It was while teaching a class at Wesleyan that I thought of number two. I had been explaining variations one suddenly realized that two notations on the same piece of paper automatically bring about relationship. My composing is actually unnecessary. Oh, <laughs> Music never stops. It is we who turn away again the world around. Silence. Sounds are only bubbles on its surface. They burst to disappear. Throw. When we make m music, we merely make something that can more naturally be heard than seen or touched. Thank you. Great reading. Yeah. What, what, I mean, this is a great poem, I think, to start, because I would argue there's a, what do we hear? And this is a misostic, too, so that's important to realize that it, you know, it travels down the spine of that. But anybody, what I think it's an interesting poem to, to talk about in terms of the voice of the poem versus the look. Yeah. What did what attracted you to that poem in particular, Judy? Um, you were very quick to say that this was your favorite one. <laughs> I know. I was going to choose Hilda Morley because I'd never heard of her, and I was very happy that a woman who did not get you know a lot of credit was in this anthology, but. Uh, but I, 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 I like the look of it a lot on the page. Yeah. And I think the look of it really goes with the rhythm um, and the cadence of it. It's really hard to read it without kind of 
moving, you know, and um, it just seems so caged to me. I, I don't know a lot about his work, but uh, the, the chant sounds and the, you know, the playing with sounds all the time and playing with what comes up all the time. It was like the words themselves were notes that he was putting in place and letting fall where they may and then making something of that. And it just seemed, and then at the, the very last line um, or lines, we merely make something that can more naturally be heard than seen or touched. It's like music's no different from dance or art or what we see or what we, you know, or what we touch, it just, we make it music, you know? And I thought he did that so well in the poem that, that he made rhythm and the visual thing and the structure and the sound and, and, um, and even tactility with the capital letters running through the mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, there are a couple of really great zingers in there. Uh, the first one that you pointed out was, my composing is actually unnecessary, which yeah. makes perfect sense for Cage, you know, relying on chance for, for a lot of his composition. Thanks. I would add too that, um, especially since I'm sitting here in Dublin, but of course we know Cage as, as you know, composer and, and obviously a great writer and thinker, but he was initially, before he was seriously composing, very seriously interested in the modernist writers, Joyce and Eliot and so forth. And he does say, and towards the end of his life, he was essentially only, or at least he claimed, was only reading Joyce's Finnegan's Wake and said that that could keep him busy for 20 years without having to read anything else. And he does write a huge number of these mesostic poems on the name James Joyce or Marcel Duchamp, these people mm. who, who influenced him. And it was a way of arranging almost arbitrarily his chance operations in, in what he was doing. So it's a really interesting tension between structure and chance uh, and literary illusion and history with something that's kind of detached from it and almost removing authority from it. So I, I think Cage is so interesting in that way. And of course that goes on for a whole book. So you yeah. can get that somewhere else. <laughs> well, Something it's, it's, to look into, Judy. <laughs> now I was going to mention yeah. how, play, how playful it is too in the amazing en enjambments across mm -hmm. the white space of the stanzas. It's mm -hmm. just kind of brilliant. And I, I would point this out too. Um, Black Mountain poets aren't often narrative, but there's a decided narrative here too. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful piece. Thank you, Judy, for picking that. That's just perfect. <laughs> Sandy, what page? Uh, page five, Charles Olson. Okay. It's called These Go Days. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Whatever you have to say, leave the roots on, let them dangle and the dirt just to make clear where they came from. I love that. I love that in your voice too. That was great. That was great. Going Sandy, what was it? Fields. What yeah. was it about uh, uh, these days that attracted you? I, I liked it because it's it's such a small in terms of the number of words in a poem, and I like the fact that poetry can sort of distill such big ideas with such few words. I can't do that. I tend to be very wordy in my writing, and um, and you know, I just, I thought that was very, you know, well done in that way, uh, that it made me think a lot in however, less than like 20 words or something. Yeah. Um, and I like the contrast between the words roots and dangle. Um, one, one word being very grounded and the other, you know, sort of flapping about in the wind. I thought those, and, and letting dangle, um, have its own space, you know, in, in the line. It's, it, it, it looked like it was dangling. Um, mm -hmm. And then to leave in the dirt, I like the idea of something that, you know, uh, can, can include things that are messy, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, things that you might not want to recall or you might not want to say in front of other people, but, you know, Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and say that. The dirt also might be what nourishes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, usually roots are something that we don't necessarily see. And he's pulled them up for us to remind us not only that they're there dangling, but to leave the dirt on <laughs> to, mm -hmm. 
to remind you where they come from. I, I love that visual image. It's such, in, as you said, Sandy, in an economy of words, so visual. Very much. And I, I had a, just a, if I could, just ask a question and um, about somebody had mentioned Hilda Morley, and she's the person that I know least about. Uh, and I, I read, um, Jonathan, in, in your introduction, I think, or somewhere in the book, that she's influenced by the metaphysical poets. Could you speak to that for a second? Yeah, that's a reference. Well, again, she was a, a, an extraordinary person and poet who very few people know about. I mean, I know there are people doing work uh, on, on Morley's work. Um, Mary, Emma, Mary Emma and I have talked about this, that, again, even finding it and, and having you know, permissions to look and listen and reproduce her work is, uh, you know, kind of part of the issue there. The reference, and she was uh, uh, married to Stefan Volpe as well, uh, so there's that that personal connection, um, and spent quite a lot of time at, at Black Mountain. The reference to the metaphysical poets is to a class that she taught. She taught Don, uh, John Donne, and uh, these uh, English metaphysical poets, which again, I find interesting because it's not the first thing that you associate with Black Mountain and this, you know, breaking through the mold of the, you know, the old, but again, you know, it's, it's, it's the old Ezra Pound uh, uh, concept of sort of going back to the past to reinvigorate and remake the, the present or the future. Um, so they were certainly involved in that. And I think that's important to always remember that we get a little bit carried away sometimes with the newness and the, you know, the idea of it being radical and revolutionary, but those radical and revolutionary artists and writers can see what's radical and revolutionary about poets who came before them. And the metaphysical poets are certainly that. Uh, Blake would be one that, that many of these poets yes. were interested in, and the beat poets, for example, um, quite a radical in his time, but one that, you know, um, you wouldn't necessarily at first associate with, with these kinds of poets. So I think that bit is quite interesting. And just the fact that there were all of these different kinds of teaching uh, going on and you were allowed as a teacher at Black Mountain to pursue your interest. Um, and there wasn't a prescribed, uh, prescribed curriculum in that sense. Uh, and you, you know, all of those things added up to what was quite unique and special about it. Mary Emma, did you have a comment? Yes. Um, finally, I got my video on. <laughs> Yay, it's great to see your face. <laughs> Yay, Mary Emma. What did I get wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I was worried about that, too. So. <laughs> I just think, I'm not sure how many more minutes you have, but first I'd like to thank Joseph, Jay, and Jonathan for your kind words. And the other thing is, um, I can show it to you now. Jonathan has another Black Mountain book, which should be huh. right. on letters. Okay. Um, which really has an excellent selection of documents. Um, and I think it's, um, I, one thing I love about it is he, he brings in people like Porter Sargent, um, who was an important, um, had an important um, directory of private schools and took his son to Black Mountain, but people who generally aren't recognized as having a role in Black Mountain. So um, anyway, um, I just wanted to be sure his book gets mentioned. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I've, re I've read that book. It's a wonderful book. Thank it you, really is. Terrific. Um, Joey Gelati, uh, you were also bold enough to identify a poem uh, that you liked, uh, too, by John Wieners on page 93. Did you want to read it for us, Joey? I'll give it a try. Go for it. <laughs> the records change. Green vines hang down one white column on the balustrade. There is a marble terrace at my right and my lover walks miles away. On the other side of town where the cable car goes down and the neon lights stay on all night. Orange lamps along the wall and oak leaves sprout too small. My lover's thoughts are not of me at all. Thanks, Joey. What was it that you liked about that one in particular? I, I just, I, I'm, don't know anything about poetry, but I thought perhaps this man was a gay man. <laughs> and he, it's San Francisco, I would assume, because it's a cable car. And the poem before that is about San Francisco. So I just, I thought it was a poem about a, a, a man and his, what he thought was his lover and his thoughts about the lover. Don't know. <laughs> uh -huh. what, did you, had you read it aloud before you read it that time? No, I didn't. What, did you hear anything at all in the reading that, that struck you? 
I just the cadence of it, I just thought was beautiful. Uh, yeah. Ah, there it is. Hmm. Yeah, Wieners is one who, uh, again, you know, certain people definitely do know about, but I've heard that there's a lot more going on around uh, republishing his work and letters and work that's being written about him. So mm -hmm. if you'd like to explore, uh, there should be a lot more coming in, in the, the coming years as well. So that's a great thing. Um, I think a lot of these writers are going to be um, looked at again, which is, is great. Thank you. Anybody else bold enough to identify a poem and read it to us? Why is poetry so scary? There's a, there's <laughs> a poem that I uh, read. I did a, a, a few events in the States and around uh, uh, when this came out in November and December. Mm -hmm. And the poem I always read, <clears throat> excuse me, to close when I was talking was a Denise Levertov poem on page 35. Um, okay. In December, when these events were happening, there were uh, the the impeachment in the United States was uh, going on. Of course, that's long gone. It feels like a million years ago now, but there, are, it still seems to be a relevant poem, and and it's quite short, but I think it's quite powerful. That's the poem "Action" on page thirty-five. Yeah. Um, Levertov writes, "I can lay down that history. I can lay down my glasses." I can lay down the imaginary lists of what to forget and what must be done. I can shake the sun out of my eyes and lay everything down on the hot sand and cross the whispering threshold and walk right into the clear sea and float there, my long hair floating and fishes vanishing all around me, deep water. Little by little, one comes to know the limits and depths of power. I think that's an extraordinary poem. One thing that struck me, and Jonathan, I think you did a nice job with this, is we talked about the music, but I love how the poems are often in conversations with one another and how the poets are in conversation with one another. I, that's a striking element of the book in terms of in, in, with a few poems and, and under 100 pages, you managed to create that kind of a conversation. Uh, that, that was something that really struck me as a reader of this anthology. Thank you. Yeah, that was intentional. So that's great that it comes across because again, I think that conversation, I'd forgotten to mention that an initial interest in Black Mountain uh, of mine was correspondence, the letter writing, yes. the prolific letter writing yes. between all of these people, Olson and Creeley in particular, their correspondence from 1950 to 1954 is published in 11 volumes. Wow. <laughs> and they never met before at that time. So it's, it's really extraordinary just in that instance, but in so many others, that letter writing, um, Creeley said they, I think he was citing William Carlos Williams, but that letters were rehearsals for what they were going to do in their poems. And because these poets, Creeley's first proper large publication came 10 years really after he started writing seriously to Olson. So because they didn't have these official establishment um, venues to publish in. One, they created their own, Creeley's Divers Press, etc. Mm -hmm. Black Mountain Review, um, and they were primarily writing to one another in their letters. This is common in the, the, the beat, you know, so-called beat uh, group of writers as well. Um, and reading their letters really gives you an insight into how they were approaching poetry because they talk about it and argue about it and criticize one another's work in it. Um, but it also enacts the poems as well. So I think it's really interesting to look at the letters and all of these poets, uh, for the most part, have um, fascinating correspondences that are published. So that's worth checking out too. Jay or Joseph, did one of you have a favorite? Jay, do you want to hold forth first? I'm, I, <laughs> I, 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 I was struck by the Albers poems. Somebody's mentioned those before. Um, I would go back to these days as well. I love that poem in, in terms of, I think, what we've been talking about, both just the imagery and also that sense of, of <laughs> they're coming from someplace, these, these words. And, and um, you know, that sense of knowing the past and making it new in the present uh, is something that, that, again, somebody was talking about it being 20 words or so. I, I love the compression that, that Olsen can achieve in that point. I'm glad that you mentioned that uh, Joseph Albers poems because, and I was so 
pleasantly surprised to see them, Jonathan. I had no idea that he wrote poetry, but for me, uh, the poems matched what I know of the man and the artist. They just seem very spare and deliberate and to the point <laughs> and visual. Um, Jay, do you want to maybe read one of them? The one that, that struck me, and I'm just going to read a section, a, a part of it, but that uh, that starts more or less on page two. Okay. Um, that first part, easy to know that diamonds are precious, good to learn that rubies have depth, but more to see that pebbles are miraculous. Uh, you know, sort of making what you can from what you have. Um, yeah. Yeah. which Black Mountain College, all, all those teachers were having to do, particularly, yeah. particularly in the art department, right? Oh. Right. Mary Emma? I, I long loved um, Albert's poems, and actually I had not read, it was not meant to be before, but that's sort of why I'm sort of cautious not to read it. So I'll end what Jay started, which I often <laughs> remind myself, and this was to Albert's students who were really consumed by their sense of self-importance. And um, I often remind myself, I have it actually typed on a piece of paper, calm down, what happens, happens mostly without you. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. It yes. just sort of, you know, reminds you of, of um, a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, I was really struck by that line, you know, as we said before, you know, with the cage poems, you know, there were a lot of zingers <laughs> in here, things just to remind us about our place in the universe. Albert's yeah. sense of humor comes through in his poems. Um, they really can be very amusing as well as insightful. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Mary. I, I, would, I, I, I would love to read uh, M.C. Richard's poem since I, I'll, I'll read kind of her her wheelbarrow poem in a way it's a famous oh. one it's the strawberry poem that, that, I love that probably everyone you know knows it what um, page joseph it's on page 54 it's the second one under they are sleeping and, and again i'm so thrilled she's in here um her omission was again egregious and and as a teacher too she was just extra she was an extraordinary teacher uh, fielding always said that she was the heart and soul of black mountain when she was there when he was there Strawberry. In November, the strawberry hangs on a thread of sleep. In May, it lies in my hand like an erotic dream. So the wonderful transformation there, you know, too, and, and just the line breaks, you know, in November and May, we have that sort of six months, we have the solstice to the equinox and, you know, it hangs too. I mean, it reminds me a whole lot of, of uh, William Carlos Williams, um, the wheelbarrow. So much depends. Hangs and depends are kind of sim synonyms in this context. So we see that so much, so much really depends on the strawberry, you know, in, in that wonderful closure, it becomes an erotic dream. And mm -hmm. strawberries are kind of <laughs> erotic, exotic, um, luscious, all that. So and Will, William Carlos Williams is definitely, uh, you know, a kind of shadow behind all of this. Or yeah, he, 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 he's, he's there without being there and is, of course, a New Directions poet as well. There was a time when we considered putting in some of the almost the forerunners in that sense. Ah. Um, but of course, that um, it, we we decided against it, but there there was some discussion of of including a, a Williams poem or even epigraph or something like this. But Sandy, you had a question. Uh, I I just had some comments about people like me who, when they travel, go to cemeteries where, <laughs> wherever they are. And um, if you want to pay homage to Robert Creeley, I lived in near Boston for a long time, and. He was born in Arlington, Massachusetts, and I lived there for 30 years, so I would go to Mount Auburn Cemetery and visit his family plot. <laughs> I was mm -hmm. homesick for North Carolina, so, mm -hmm. um, so oh. it's, a, it's a beautiful cemetery like Père Lachaise Garden Cemetery, and then other Black Mountain folks like Kenneth Nolan are buried here in Asheville at Riverside Cemetery, so. Right, right. I have to say that Creeley is, is was, and is, you know, a, a Kind of primary personal interest to me and just as a short kind of funny story i was writer in residence with the lannan foundation in marfa texas and the house that i lived in that they gave me was the last house that robert creeley wow. lived in um, and wrote presumably the the books in his last uh, the poems in his last book on earth um, and i was in touch with penny creeley his his widow at that time 
and she asked me to go out and check if the garden she planted was still in the back. It wasn't there, but it wow. was sort of extraordinary. And apparently this house is haunted as well. So um, I never experienced that, but you know, perhaps he's, he's still knocking around there in some way. But yeah, his poems are, uh, and his whole body of work is, is, is very important to me. So uh, we have just run over a little bit on time. I'm wondering, Joseph, J., Jonathan, uh, even Mary Emma, does anyone have any last parting words for us? Uh, or perhaps uh, if, if we're interested in learning more about some of the Black Mountain poets, um, where we should go? You know, you're holding the book right now. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I, I literally <laughs> am holding the book. Yeah, but, but also, you know, I mean, all of these, all of these writers have their own volumes too. Not all of them cage. There's not a, a collected cage or albums, but, but these poems are available. Yeah, there's, there's Creeley and certainly Olson and I mean, just about Duncan, just about all of them. If you were turned oh, yeah. on to a particular um, poet, you know, dig deeply and you know, a lot of the tips I think that Jonathan gives us in the introduction, if you want to take that kind of labyrinthine dive into into uh, Black Mountain College, you know, the avenues and the tributaries are 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 endless and fast. Beware. <laughs> Beware. It's uh it's endless. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think at some point, each of the three of you have, have said the word obsession when referring to Black Mountain College. <laughs> and of course, I know it, Mary Emma, it's your life's work. I, well, that's I, it. I, Read Mary Emma's book. Mary Emma's book has, has to be read if you're interested in, in any I, of it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I remember one thing that I think, Mary Emma, you said to our class, and it, and it echoes what John Rice writes, and, and Jonathan quotes the Harper's Monthly article um, in the introduction, but that notion, and I was struck by it again, a grammar of the art of living and working in the world. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things Mary Emma said, and, I, and I've seen it in the people I've known, is that their lives were changed by the Black Mountain College experience. And, and, and you see it in the, in the way they present themselves in the world, the spaces they inhabit, um, it, it, their, their being, if you will, in the world, uh, a kind of ethos. And I, and I, and I think we sense that in, in so many people who've been connected to this college, the writers, the artists, the students, uh, the teachers. Um, and what I'd say, what continues on from that Rice quote, and I think it's quite relevant today and, and really central to the whole idea, the, the larger idea, he says, the world as it is, isn't worth saving. It must be made over. That's the, 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 the challenge and the practice and the, the you know, the conviction of, of these. Yeah. Mary Emma, final words. Uh, well, I'd like to thank you, Christy, for putting this together. Yes, thank you, Christy. Uh, and also, Joseph, Jonathan, and Jay, I have no corrections. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're all so scared of you, Mary Emma, that we're not saying the right thing. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> Um, and there was one other thought, and I've lost it, so I'll just end here. Oh, thank you, Miriam. <laughs> it's always you. good to see you. Yeah, it is good to see you. And I, I always think when Mary, Mary Emma talking about being a, a student, and, and I think it was somebody in the art history department saying, you, you can't do your thesis on Black Mountain College, you know? I mean, there's, I think they might have said, and I'm paraphrasing, there's nothing there. So she, she unearthed an entire world predicated on that challenge. I mean, and keeps and it, unearthing it. Well, and there's still so much to be done. I mean, Absolutely. It's, it's extraordinary. Yeah. Go ahead, Mary Emma. Well, I've forgotten again what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, Mary Emma. <laughs> yeah, that was in 1968 when I discovered Black Mountain College. It's been a wonderful, wonderful, long journey. But I think one word I come back to in terms of just the incredible explosion of energy around Black Mountain now. Mm -hmm. touchstone. I mean, for a lot of people in the arts who were, it, be, it became a touchstone for the students and faculty who were there as they moved on in their careers. But for a lot of people in the arts, it's sort of a touchstone that we can, we can identify various creative issues with, very impul you know, impulses. Um, and so it's one of many touchstones that we look to, but I, I like the word touchstone. 
Me too. Thank you. You're always a touchstone for us too, Mary Emma, whenever we have questions about BMC. Um, I would like to thank uh, Joseph and Jay uh, for being our moderators today and uh, agreeing to take on this book. Um, the folks at Malaprops, of course, brought, brought it to my attention that it was recently published. Um, Malaprops, of course, our discussion bound book group is one of their monthly book groups and we're just absolutely thrilled to work with them on a monthly basis. I'd like to thank Jonathan um, for joining thank us. You. He sent thank me you. an email yeah. on Sunday saying, hey, I see you're talking about my book and <laughs> was able to jump on and it's been a real pleasure having you here. Yeah, what a wonderful yeah. surprise and pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, and thanks, Mary Emma, for making that happen. Post, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have announced uh, the July and August uh, selections for Discussion Bound. Uh, next month, uh, July 14th, we'll be talking about The Art Forger, a novel by B.A. Shapiro, and I am going to be joined in moderating that discussion by Hilary Schroeder who is our assistant curator and on the line today. Um, and then on August 11th, we are going to continue uh, diving into Black Mountain with the new um, biography of Ruth Asawa called Everything She Touched, The Life of Ruth Asawa by Marilyn Chase. So those are our next two uh, book discussions. If you're interested in joining either one of those, please do send me an email so I can get you on the list. We will stay uh, in the virtual realm through the summer, so we will be having our conversations via Zoom. Uh, I hope you all have a great week. It's been a pleasure spending um, this time with you this afternoon. Uh, I'll be sending an evaluation after the program today. So thanks again to Jay, Joseph, Jonathan, and Mary Emma for joining us, and thanks to all of you for dialing in and to contributing. I hope you have a great week. Christy, thank you, and thank you yeah. to all who joined us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for being here, everybody, and thanks for all of this, Christy and yeah. Jonathan and all of you. It's just thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Pleasure. Thanks to those of you too who are bold enough to read a poem aloud. Yes. <laughs> oh yes, for sure. <laughs> Take care. Have a great week, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. So thank you all. all.